Very happy to be here. Uh, it's um, the second year. Uh, last year, also in December, I came to make a presentation on more or less on the same topic. Uh, but now we have two years of implementation of uh, uh, the um, economic policy uh, of President Trump. Uh, so last year, the presentation was rather speculative. Uh, this year, the, we have more concrete elements and also a number of data that uh, can give uh, us uh, a, uh, a clearer picture uh, of the economic policy that is currently uh, carried out in the United States. The, um, just to put it a little bit uh, uh, clearer, the, um, uh, I'm not dealing any longer with the G20. I've done that between 2010 and 2015. But now I move on and uh, I am in, in the United States. Um, and uh, as I say, very happy to have this seminar uh, here. Last year, one of your colleagues, after I had the opportunity to come to the Austrian Embassy in Washington uh, in, uh, uh, um, in the summer of this year, and we were organizing an event with the chief economist of the uh, trade unions in uh, uh, um, uh, uh, in Washington with the EU Financial Counselors and she came to visit me. I hope that uh, some of you will have your, uh, the opportunity with uh, <coughs> your uh, uh, states to have something similar, so don't hesitate to come to see me if you come to Washington uh, in, in the future. Um, so let's move on because there is not much time. I have a lot of slides, so I have to be particularly well disciplined. So the presentation is in five uh, uh, parts. Uh, the first uh, I mean, you will not understand Tramponomics uh, without starting with the Great Recession and what uh, the economic policy of his predecessor, President Obama. So this will be the first part. The second, uh, we will see what uh, Tramponomics uh, uh, in year one, uh, where most of the uh, <coughs> domestic uh, uh, policy agenda has been uh, uh, passed. Um, after we will see uh, what happens in year two, that will be mostly on trade uh, policies. And after uh, we'll see a little bit uh, what we know in terms of uh, outcomes, uh, possible repercussions of the US and, uh, uh, the, uh, um, uh, and the global economy and the spillovers on the global economy. And after the, the final part and the conclusions uh, uh, concern the, the challenges ahead. So, I will not do a, 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 a review of the Great Recession and these uh, outcomes, uh, because otherwise we, I would take the, 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 entire, the entire hour and even more. So, just to say, in the United States, the Great Recession generated a decline in GDP growth in 2008-2009, rising unemployment, uh, raising inequalities, decline in the world trade, and financial instability. How the President Obama reacted to that? I mean, the main piece of legislation was a fiscal stimulus of $787 billion, uh, close to 3% of GDP, um, to stimulate the economy and to counter the decline in the GDP growth. Um, but also, part of it was used, for instance, for the rescue of the auto sector, plus, of course, the banking sector. Uh, and the uh, um, part was aimed at stimulating new, pro new productions uh, and sectors. The green economy was uh, particularly high in the uh, President Obama agenda. Uh, um, information technology and uh, <coughs> the, uh, high, uh, the <coughs> high technology sectors uh, were among the beneficiaries. Um, it also tried to address the issue of uh, rising inequalities that was mostly market driven by uh, um, the Affordable Care Act, that is the health care reform, because part of it was paid uh, uh, through taxes uh, on high income uh, um, uh, uh, household, uh, and uh, the benefit were going rather to people with a low income or no income. Uh, and the uh, executive order to, and, the, and there were a number of uh, executive order to strengthen unions in uh, in factories, in particular large factories, uh, that, and that they try to uh, deal with rising inequalities. <coughs> the, uh, 
In order to counter the uh, decline in the world trade, he uh, promoted a new generation of trade deals, the uh, Trans Transatlantic Pacific Partnership, uh, that was agreed just before he stepped down, and that will be uh, revoked by President Trump. The uh, Transatlantic Trade uh, and Investment Partnership that was with the European Union, that was at the final stages, uh, but uh, was never finalized because uh, uh, President Obama stepped down, and uh, he saw that uh, his successor, that was not in the imagine pres uh, President Trump, would... Uh, 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 finalize it, but uh, uh, that didn't happen, etc. And after financial stability, there is the Frank, uh, the Dodd Frank Act, the strengths and the supervisory powers uh, and the regulatory powers uh, of the uh, um, federal government uh, uh, on, on the financial sector in order to reduce the uh, systemic risk that uh, it can generate. What was the the idea of the Obama was to, that to create a sort a number of, vi of virtual circles through uh, the uh, strength of welfare, more investment, and so on. So both through the demand side, uh, then on structural reforms uh, uh, or incentive to uh, the high-tech sector or the trade deals to create uh, more demand to support growth and the growth would support investment. And so you can see the traditional accelerator model uh, um, that you probably know very well. The, uh, uh, some productivity that was both endogenous and exogenous. And in the meantime, stronger growth determined by the return to full employment and to higher wages. However, things didn't go. I mean, he, you have not to forget that uh, he had a majority until 2010. And so after 2010, he was very limited in what he could do by Congress. And for instance, investment infrastructure uh, uh, was never passed uh, in the uh, amount that he wanted. Uh, the um, fiscal stimulus was quite limited. And he faced a number of challenges in his uh, uh, industrial policies that they were either to support the green industry or to uh, rescue the, the car sector. So that was how he thought the, 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 the recovery and how to come out of the Great Recession. Things went uh, rather differently. Uh, so there were winners and losers after eight years of uh, uh, Obamanomics. The winners were the coastal areas, in general, high skilled workers in the IT sector. Um, I mean, the, the, during this period, the wages are stagnant. Eh? Uh, where you see that there are increases in general is the very high end, very well paid workers in the IT sector, or people uh, at the bottom uh, uh, with uh, minimum wages, mostly because many states pass legislation to increase uh, uh, the minimum wage in, in, during his presidency. Government employees, at least had uh, um, some particular federal government employees, at the least uh, the guarantee of keeping their job. Uh, on the mi medium term, I mean, there were a number of initiatives, particularly through executive orders, that is uh, something that uh, uh, can <coughs> the president can introduce without the approval of Congress. The disadvantage of that is that uh, the next president can cancel all of them, as we will see. So on the medium term, minorities, unionized workers in large companies and farmers because of the trade deals uh, 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 would have uh, uh, gained. Among the losers, there were uh, in areas, uh, in particular the, the, the Midwest and so on, workers in traditional industry. The transition to a low carbon green technology put a number of workers in the coal industry, in the old heavy steel coal industries uh, uh, out of work or in a very difficult situation. Uh, the development of Amazon and so on uh, hurt uh, uh, retailers and department stores, uh, and uh, they started a, a sharp decline, so that was among the losers. Partial, what I call partial losers is that they didn't lose. I mean, the uh, top decile of income earners, they saw their, uh, um, their income increasing, but as we'll see, I mean, when President Trump becomes president, they gain even more, because, I mean, the 
while they were continuing to gain, they saw, for instance, uh, because of uh, Obamacare, because of the repeal of the Bush tax cut for the uh, top bracket uh, in the incomes, and so on, they saw part of the, uh, um, or the taxes going up for them. And so while the market continued to boost their, the, the, the growth of, uh, uh, of, of their share on income, they got less than they could have had uh, with a, a different president. And Wall Street is the same. I mean, the <coughs> as we will see, uh, the, the, the recovery of uh, the um, stock market doesn't start with Trump. I mean, the, it goes up uh, uh, during the Obama years, uh, but uh, with Trump, you see a, a significant acceleration. So, going back. So, as I say, the outcomes, uh, um, recovery with low growth. I mean, the growth was around 2%, some year a little bit, some, some year uh, 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 a little bit less by historical standards. It's also true that uh, the population dynamic is lower, so the, the, the potential growth is... Uh, smaller than, than it was in the past. And as I say, star never aligned. Policy, there was policy uncertainty because the, uh, in the Congress that was dominated by the Republicans, there was opposition and so couldn't carry out his, his policy. Global economy, there's been a, a number of troubles during those years. The, the sovereign debt crisis in Europe, uh, troubles in China in 2015-2016. Financial conditions uh, uh, tightened suddenly in 2016 with the dollar uh, appreciating uh, sharply. Um, and there was the boom and boost of the, of the energy sector because of shale production. Uh, when oil prices were high, you have the US recovering pretty strongly. And after you have a sudden decline uh, when there is a collapse of the oil prices in 2015. And uh, all this uh, never helped to uh, uh, the, the, the Obama administration to have, uh, uh, as I say, that all the conditions to bring uh, growth stronger. And in fact, al starts with aligning, in fact, in, at the end of 2016. Um, there is a steady decline in, in unemployment. So no, I mean, the, the uh, stars is a sort of metaphor. So I mean, all the elements uh, of uh, uh, the policy or the economy that allow you to have a stronger growth, uh, at least for uh, in the short to medium term, you had always something that was an headwind. Uh, sometimes was the uh, international economic situation. Sometimes was a tightening of the domestic financial condition. Sometimes was uh, the risk of shutdown of the government in 2011, 2012 because of uh, domestic uh, uh, problems. Uh, so the, the um, as I say, you can see economic growth was positive. I mean, this is one of the longest recovery of the United States, uh, if it continues in 2019, will be the longest recovery on record. Uh, but it's not particularly strong. So time to time, you see also uh, one quarter of negative growth um, and uh, an average growth of about 2%. Uh, unemployment uh, went down, but also the participation rate uh, in the United States went down, in particular because there is an opioid crisis in many states that takes away uh, scores of population from the labor market, uh, the stock market, as I said. Um, and interesting, in income inequalities. I mean, they declined in 2007 because the first impact of uh, a big crisis is that the, the wealthiest uh, lose most. But after, as soon as you have the recovery, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the inequality increase, in part also because of the monetary policy, QE, helped the recovery of the stock market. So the people who had uh, a lot of assets saw their, uh, their, uh, uh, their wealth uh, increasing significantly. There is a sh short moment in which uh, the policy of the Obama administration are able to reduce the increase in inequalities, uh, in particular between 2013 and 2015. That is related mostly to the uh, um, repeal, as I said, of the tax cuts for the riches that Bush, President Bush had introduced, and uh, they increased the minimum wage in a number of uh, US states, but not at federal level, so not in all the states. 
So, and after passing the baton, uh, President Obama didn't expect to pass the baton to President Trump, uh, but it happened. So, uh, and as you can say, I think that the, the, the cartoon showed it quite well. Uh, President Trump intended to take a completely different direction, um, and that is what happened. So, first the question is: Is there Trumponomics? I mean, the, there was. A Reaganomics, uh, there's been a Clintonomics, there's been an Obamanomics. Uh, the question is, I mean, the uh, President Obama didn't have a coherent vision for, uh, uh, for the economy. Uh, and so during the, camp the presidential campaign, he had not a well-polished and coherent economic program, but rather a collection of eclectic, bold ideas. Which are these bold ideas? Uh, Substantially su supply side economics. Arthur Laffer was one of his advisors. Uh, so, tax cut, uh, the regulation, economic nationalism, trade, that is something on which uh, um, he has always been very adamant. I mean, it's one of the things that he said when he entered in the electoral contest in the primaries of the Republican Party was uh, I mean, all the previous presidents have made very bad deals for the United States. I know how to make deals, he wrote a book, The Art of the Deal. So this is something that uh, I can uh, get much better terms for the uh, American uh, economy. So the, uh, the other idea was the deconstruction of the administrative state through the regulation and the repeal and replace of Obamacare. These uh, ideas that come from, at the time, his uh, chief political advisors and sort of uh, ideologue uh, uh, of uh, uh, the uh, um, Trump administration, Steve Bannon. So the, the all this, in his view, would have uh, created uh, a sustainable and sustained 4% growth for the US economy. Um, although, I mean, this, everybody, including the economists on the Republican side, consider it uh, unrealistic and uh, unattainable. Um, and if applied literally, and we'll see the, tru the Trump program would have triggered an explosion of the federal uh, uh, deficit and debt. Uh, um, I can show you. So this was uh, a, a calculation that the Committee for Responsible Fiscal Budget uh, made uh, uh, on the basis of uh, what uh, uh, press, uh, candidate Clinton and candidate Trump uh, were promising. You can see that uh, in the case of uh, uh, candidate uh, Clinton stayed, I mean, the, her proposal uh, were clearly staying, were very fiscally responsible, and probably for that were also very unexciting, while the uh, uh, proposal of President Trump would have made an explosion of the federal deficit and the federal debt, but that made them uh, quite attractive for a number of voters. Coming back, uh, um, so, the, uh, what is important is that the program itself, I mean, President Trump never claimed that it was a well-polished, coherent, uh, that is what the thing. I mean, the, the program was to vehicle the message, uh, I'm going to change Washington, and I'm going to change the policy and so on, and after will be Congress who will work out the details, uh, and the thing will not be exactly how I've presented, but uh, some form of it. Um, so who was advising Trump during the electoral campaign? There were three groups. Um, one was the Reagan supply siders, people who had worked for the uh, uh, um, Reagan administration and that uh, had uh, the, uh, uh, this idea that uh, by cutting taxes, uh, you would create a positive change in animal spirits uh, uh, that would have led to more investment, uh, more productivity growth, and more growth in the end. Um, and these people are Larry Carlo, uh, Steve Moore, Arthur Laffer, the famous of uh, the, the Laffer curve, David, David Malpass, and the, the uh, some, I mean, no, they're not really economists, uh, we're uh, economist commentators, uh, uh, some of them, uh, or uh, working for conservative think tanks, uh, uh, on, uh, on the thing. The, the, um, after there were Wall Street operatives, uh, here there is a mistake. Gary Cohn comes later, so should not be in the list. I will take it out in the final version. But people like Steve Mnuchin, who was also the, uh, the finance campaign manager for Trump, 
or Carl Icahn, who is uh, a tycoon uh, in Wall Street, uh, um, and, uh, um, and they were rather uh, focused on financial deregulation um, and tax reform. But they were also, uh, in a way, considered close to mainstream economics. Uh, and after the economic nationalist, uh, Steve Bannon, uh, more in general nationalist to cool, um, Wilbur Ross, uh, Peter Navarro, Ross and Navarro wrote uh, the uh, trade program for um, President Trump uh, and also look at the uh, infrastructure program. So they were uh, focus was mostly on trade issues. The interesting thing is that uh, the mainstream Republican economists, uh, which uh, like uh, Robert Barrow, uh, Martin Fest and so on, they were not involved. I mean, they were considered too close to the mainstream Republicans to the swamp in Washington to, to, to be part of, of the story. So the other thing that is important is that Trump is uh, not a typical conservative. So this is an axis. Uh, I mean, this is a graph taken uh, by, the, uh, um, uh, uh, by an article of uh, uh, Kelton, uh, who was the chief economist for uh, um, uh, uh, Bernie Sanders. And this shows that, I mean, the, on the topics, I mean, there, there is a strong nationalist conservative uh, dimension, but there are also topics on trade where it was not very far from Trump, uh, from uh, Sanders, for instance, or infrastructure spending, he said that he wanted to have one trillion uh, uh, program uh, on some social issues uh, was rather considered and was attacked also by in the primaries by his uh, uh, opponents to be uh, on, the, on the liberal side. So you have a, a rather scattered, uh, heterogeneous uh, uh, um, distribution of the traditional axis, nationalist, globalist, conservatives, uh, uh, liberals, that liberals in the US sense, of course, so uh, progressive. So now we, saw, uh, we go to see what uh, happened uh, during the uh, one year of uh, uh, the first year of President Trump. So the main points were repeal and replace Obamacare, tax reform, tax cut, raise military spending while there's uh, downsizing the federal government, uh, dismantle regulation of the Obama administration, withdrawal from the um, TPP, so the Trans-Pacific uh, uh, Partnership. And that was the first measure that he, take, he took. I mean, that to send immediately the signal that on trade, uh, he would be, uh, uh, we would stick to his program. The, the first measure was uh, uh, to withdraw from TPP from day one. Prepare trade retaliatory measures against countries with large trade supplies vis-a-vis -vis the United States and the partial withdrawal to the global liberal order. So the first move was not really his preferred one. I mean, the... Um, this was rather a push by Republican Congress. I mean, the, the, the Republicans were really hating uh, uh, Obamacare. They consider it, uh, as I mentioned, cost too much, limits individual choice, expand the power of our government. In one word, uh, as Lindsey Graham, uh, the senator from South Carolina, uh, Republican senator from South Carolina, he is the choice for America, socialism or federalism when it comes to uh, your health care. So the, um, the, 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 the Republicans were really w wanted really to repeal and replace Obamacare. The president goes uh, with, with the proposal and, uh, and, and support, but uh, uh, I mean, the, the Republicans never managed to get the 50 votes in the Senate. Uh, famously, Senator McCain voted against uh, the repeal and replace of Obamacare. And therefore, the initial, the first big battle that uh, uh, President Trump and the Republican in Congress fight uh, against the, uh, uh, the, 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 the uh, uh, Obama administration policies fails face dramatically. And therefore, they have to counter it uh, with passing the tax reform tax cuts. I mean, that, uh, the, the existential imperative, I, take, I took it from Karl Rove, who was the chief political advisor of President Bush and still an, uh, an influential uh, Republican commentator. They said, I mean, the, this is the existential imperative. If after having failed uh, with Obamacare, we fail with tax cut, and tax reform, where that has always been the flagship 
of the proposal of the, uh, uh, of the Republicans and the Conservatives, then we are dead. And therefore, despite a lot of difficulties, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, in the end, the tax reform and tax cuts pass. Um, the interesting thing is that there were two proposals. There was the President Trump proposal, the one that makes the federal budget uh, exploding, and there was uh, the proposal of the House Majority Leader, Paul Ryan, who had the tax reform uh, uh, fiscally neutral, so that uh, would not, not have cost, would not have increased the, the, the deficit and the debt. The only problem that to make a tax reform that is fiscally neutral is very difficult, uh, and therefore to be sure to get the votes uh, in, the, uh, 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 in Congress, you have to give goodies, uh, and, uh, and therefore you have also to make tax cuts. And that, in the end, was what happened. Um, and as we'll see, it was, I mean, the tax cuts were not small. It was $1.5 trillion over 10 years. That is, is some money. Um, the, um, what were the main, so the, 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 the tax reform had three, uh, uh, um, two major pillars. One uh, is the personal income, where there is a, a um, reduction of taxes for uh, the, um, almost for everybody, um, where the top tax rate drops from 39.6% to 37, but also the, 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 the bracket moves uh, higher. So, I mean, the, uh, some of the people who were taxed 39.6 for certain amount of income, now for them is 35 or even lower. So, it is uh, a distribution of, uh, money to the taxpayers, um, highly different. I mean, the people who gain, uh, they are multimillionaire, save uh, more than $50,000 a year, depending on how, uh, let's say, if you are, uh, get one million, it's about 50,000. If you have uh, an income of $20,000, it's only uh, 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 $100, $200. So, I mean, th there is a distribution effect that is not negligible. Um, there are also, in order to finance part of it, uh, the, the some tax benefits uh, um, are uh, uh, for people, for instance, that have a mortgage, are eliminated or reduced. There are a number of other issues that you will find in the slides if you are interested. Um, substantially is uh, a significant tax cut uh, that takes away the, the uh, 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 a significant part of revenue for, for, for the federal government, and therefore, as we will see, it's not possible to, yeah, the, 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 uh, um, to prolong if after 2025, uh, uh, unless uh, something happened uh, before that date. Um, I will mention that. The, the other part is the corporate side. Also there, the most important thing is the reduction of the corporate tax rate from 35 to 21. Um, the United States uh, has a corporate rate that uh, was much higher than the OECD average, but uh, there were a lot of uh, uh, deductions um, possible. So the effective rate was in, re in reality 21-22%. But I mean, some companies, in particular multinational, they were able to pay even down to 15%, while other companies 35 So there was an agreement. I mean, the, also, Obama had, the, uh, uh, for twice, uh, tried to pass a reform. Didn't bring it so low as 21, but uh, he proposed 28%. Um, so the, 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 uh, the corporate tax rate is reduced significantly. Some of the deductions have taken away, so the, the system is rationalized. There are also a number of uh, issues that uh, um, change the tax system in a uh, uh, on a territorial system that is more similar to the European one from a global one. So the, the it is an important in itself uh, uh, tax reform, but as I say, that uh, has uh, a high cost to it. So the, the, um, the effects are that the, uh, uh, it costs 1.5 trillion over 10 years. And if you take account feedback effect, uh, supply side and, and, and so on, it's still 1 trillion still $1 trillion uh, over 10 years, so has an important impact on the, on the deficit, on the debt. How much it stimulates the economy? 
I mean, the, the, um, I give here a, a number of estimates that are, that are given in terms of supply side. The, the, the most interesting uh, piece is probably the Barrow and Furman uh, um, piece because Barrow is uh, 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 close to the Republicans. Furman uh, was the former uh, um, head of the Council of Economic Advisor for, uh, um, for President Obama. They tried to find something that uh, uh, is compatible. They use the Ramsey uh, growth model um, uh, to, to estimate. And, and they, they arrived at the conclusion that uh, um, if uh, certain expenses are made permanent, uh, uh, the uh, um, over 10 years, uh, the impact on growth is 0.1% per year. So cumulative is about 1.3% of GDP. Um, so the, 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 there is, and that mostly due to an increase in investment. Um, so there is an impact, but it's far from huge. It's not insignificant. Uh, and after in the final part of the article, I mean, the. Mr. Furman discussed why he thinks that is lower, and uh, Mr. Barrow discussed why he thinks that is higher. But I mean, the, at least the, the, there was a sort of common basis to start uh, to make some estimates. The others are all, as you can see, in the same range between 1.3 to 0.9, uh, 0.4 over, over 10 years. But uh, this is uh, the supply side effect. The demand side effect. Uh, uh, are mostly concentrated over the two years and are around 0.7 to 0.9 percent uh, boosting growth for, uh, uh, for the two years. Um, so, as usual, there are winners and losers. The winners uh, is the top 1 percent, for the reason that I explained before. The losers uh, are not directly, but the lowest two quintile, if you think that at a certain moment uh, the uh, you will have to do fiscal consolidation. And uh, there is not much that is left to consolidate in the, in, in the federal government because the, uh, um, uh, what are considered discretionary spending, education, military, and so on, is already reduced at 6% of GDP, 3% for the military, 3% for the rest. And very soon, with the increase in the, in the debt and the interest rates, the part paid on interest rates will be higher than the entire discretionary spending of, of the federal government. So the risk is that uh, in order to consolidate, if you don't want to raise taxes, that is always very difficult and unpopular, as you know also in France, uh, the, uh, uh, what you try to do is to cut some uh, social programs or educational programs. So, and in that case, the main losers would be the lowest two quintiles. Um, the other interesting thing is the following. As I mentioned, the, uh, there's a repeal <coughs> on the um, tax deduction that you could do at state level, for instance, for paying uh, your mortgage in the house or the state, sorry, the, sto the state lo local taxes. Um, this uh, is uh, clearly higher in the state that tax more, California, New York, and so on. So the, the and in a way, I mean, there is a, a reason behind that that makes sense. So why a state, you do, should have a, a deduction on the taxes that you pay for your local government, um, while other, if you live in another state where you have less taxes, you have less deduction. So let's make homogeneous everywhere. The only problem is that I mean, the, the states that have uh, higher taxes are also the states that are the richest and that they pay more to the federal government and vice versa. So I mean, the, um, we start to see a sort of transfer union problem that, uh, uh, that we see strong in Europe when the, 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 the rich states say, well, you are going to tax, I mean, to, to reduce the tax benefit that we have, but we are already contributing most of the others to the, uh, to the federal government, and therefore we are not, uh, uh, we don't agree on that. And, and that has been particularly clear, it's one of the factors that has determined the strong win of the Democrats in the last uh, midterm elections. I mean, the Republicans have I mean, almost been swept away from states like New York, uh, uh, um, uh, California and so on, partly because some of the voters of the Republicans and so on that should have seen uh, their tax, 
taxes go down, in reality, I've seen their taxes go up because of the uh, <coughs> deduction that they've lost uh, at state and local level. Um, Medium-term impact of the deficit uh, will be politically problematic. As I said, it could uh, jeopardize, for instance, the, the investment in infrastructure. And they starve in the best, the beast, uh, as usual, the, uh, uh, as I mentioned. If they are not able to uh, find an agreement uh, um, the, the on how to reduce the deficit in general, they, they cut the spending and that has negative effect on the weakest part of the population. The other is they construct the administrative state uh, through the regulation, and you can see, I mean, I mean, the President Trump and his administration they have taken away most of the executive act that uh, President Obama uh, uh, introduced and uh, uh, carried out a very important deregulation program. Um, the one of the things was also a proposal to reduce drastically the um, discretionary spending, non-military. But that they failed. I mean, the Republicans and Democrats in Congress agreed instead on a quite expansionary uh, uh, budget, both for 2018 and 2019. And therefore, uh, adding to the stimulus, the tax cuts, we have, uh, 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 in addition, uh, 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 um, expansionary budget in a period of already uh, relatively strong economic growth. So, I mean, the as I will mention after is a sort of uh, upside down Keynesianism that the administration and Congress are carrying out. And after there is the, uh, um, the uh, um, policy in the multilateral trade system, so I said already the TPP and the TTIP, there has been the, the in 2018 the NAFTA renegotiation started. There is uh, a lot of discussion what the, the, if with China there is a two cities trap, China being the raising power, so the United States has to have uh, an economic conflict uh, with China in order to avoid that China overcomes the United States. Uh, and uh, uh, they start to use the section, sorry, it's not article, section 232 of uh, the Trade Expansion Act of 1962. Uh, that concern national security to say that, uh, um, I mean, a number of production made outside the United States represent uh, a, um, uh, a national security threat for the economy of the United States, and therefore you can introduce uh, the uh, tariffs uh, against them. Um, and, uh, and also there were reports on countries with their trade surpluses. And finally, there is the withdrawal from the Paris Agreement and therefore the rediscussion of uh, a global liberal order that was mostly shaped by the United States during the, uh, um, uh, uh, after the, the, the World War II. I'm going fast on this because I'm starting to be short of time, so, and there is still a number of slides. So interesting, I mean, how the balance of power changed uh, in the first year of the Obama administration, the, of the Trump administration, who were the main winners and losers. The main winners seems to be Wall Street first operatives. <coughs> uh, uh, Gary Cohn became the uh, uh, chairman of the uh, 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 National Economic Council, which is the key structure inside the White, White House to coordinate economic policy. And it also was able to control the Council of Economic Advisors that was independent before Trump and then now is under the National Economic Council. Uh, Steve Mnuchin, uh, who was uh, uh, a successful businessman, became Treasury Secretary. ICANN, uh, that I mentioned before, was President Special Advisor on Financial Regulation. And uh, Tillerson, uh, Although State Department, so the foreign policy, was the former CEO of ExxonMobil. So the, the, you have a very strong presence of uh, Wall Street operatives. Other winners were economic nationalists. Bannon was the White House chief strategist. Ross became Secretary of Commerce that carries out trade policies. Uh, Navarro uh, was the, uh, um, uh, the, the, the head of the, nation, the newly created National Trade Council. And Lighthizer uh, is the chief negotiator uh, uh, for, uh, to, to renegotiate trade deals with uh, NAFTA, uh, Mexico, Canada, European Union, and so on. Upper and loser seems to be the Reagan supply siders. The only thing that they got was Malpas as uh, undersecretary of the Treasury, but still they were very active in 
in uh, lobbying Congress to pass the tax reform. So they played a behind the scene role without any important uh, uh, role in the administration in the first year. Still outside the administration, mainstream Republicans were continue to be cut out. So the traditional economic uh, 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 gurus of the Republican Party were still not uh, involved in the decision making. So let's move, uh, in order not to come back, uh, what is how the situation has changed in year two. Winners have become the Reagan supply siders. So Larry Cadlow, who is a famous uh, commentator of CNBC, has become the chairman of the, uh, the director of the National Economic Council. Uh, Kevin Asset, uh, uh, who is uh, a scholar for the American Enterprise Institute and also a tax expert, has become the uh, head of the Council of Economic Advisors. Malpass is the Under Secretary of the Treasury, and uh, the other two names, so Laffer and Moore, continue to be advisors to, to the president uh, uh, at this day. Still strong, but uh, with some changes, uh, are the economic nationalists. So Bannon has been, uh, not to forget that the Reagan supply siders are pro-free trade. Uh, they support uh, Trump on China, but they think that uh, the, the, the one trade war is sufficient and not four, as we will see uh, um, later. So the uh, economic nationalist Bannon uh, uh, is out, but still Ross is Secretary of Commerce, although there are rumors that he might leave soon. Lighthizer has become really the key person in the negotiations and has, is in a very strong position on trade. And Peter Navarro, who was overshadowed by Gary Cohn uh, uh, in the first year, has now get some of his power back. The loser seems to be the Wall Street operative. Cohn is out. Um, Tillerson is out, and they have been quite critical recently in interviews or declaration of the president. I can also is out. The only key post that they keep is the Treasury. And the Western Republicans have uh, found uh, their place, that is the Federal Reserve. So people like Powell, Carida, Quarles are rather people with a strong academic background uh, and uh, quite good knowledge of monetary policies. They have not changed much compared to the, the stance of uh, Janet Yellen and, and the previous board. And uh, they, but they, they have mostly post in the, uh, in the Federal Reserve. Uh, year two, trade, 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 that I had put for uh, um, uh, uh, the, the uh, um, Canada, so I mean, take that China, but that, that, that is, uh, um, that is uh, Canada, because I mean, the, the trade war have spillovers uh, a little bit uh, um, uh, over the world. It was also for Professor Lavoie, who I understand is, is Canadian, or at least has been in Canada for a long time. So there are four wars ongoing. The first is a small one, but it was the first to start. Solar panel and the washing machine imports were uh, hit by tariffs of 25% because of um, consider, uh, um, the, the unfair practices by a number of countries, Korea, um, uh, China, etc. The battle too is still in the aluminum. This is clearly, I mean, this is something related to this. So, I mean, the, 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 there is overcapacity by China in steel and aluminum that has, has been tried to be addressed, for instance, through the G20. Um, but the, Uni the United States invokes Section 232, that is national security, to say, I mean, we have to limit uh, our imports of steel and aluminum because we are hit by China. The only problem is that uh, Steel and aluminum in the United States are already hit by anti-dumping, very uh, strong anti-dumping policies, and therefore there is almost no import from China. But there is a lot of import from Canada, the European Union, and so on. So the, 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 the tariffs, uh, while nominally are against China, in reality uh, hit the allies of the United States. And for this reason, for instance, the, Un the European Union, apart uh, for imposing uh, um, uh, countermeasures has also bring, brought the United States to, uh, the, uh, to the WTO um, and asking the WTO to reverse the situation. The third is China, um, freight trade practices, the fourth is the autos. Let me focus on China and the cars. So 
these timelines all start in 2017. Um, there is uh, clearly a problem, and the, the European Union has also a problem with the respect of intellectual property right uh, uh, in, uh, in China. Uh, and, uh, um, but the United States, instead of going through the WTO, that is, has been the practice uh, in general for this type of dispute, has chosen to go on the bilateral way. It's not the first time. I mean, the, the 301 was used also against Japan in the 80s and the 90s. But I mean, the, the it's the first time that comes back uh, uh, in, this, uh, 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 in this form. And after that, there's been escalation because the U.S. has imposed, uh, started to impose tariffs uh, on uh, Chinese goods. The Chinese have retaliated. Um, the scenes escalated to the point that uh, in September 2018, 10% of tariffs uh, have been imposed on Chinese imports. The Chinese uh, uh, um, retaliated uh, by imposing tariffs uh, on uh, 60 billion of U.S. imports. If nothing had happened, uh, uh, the U.S. would have moved from 10 to 25 percent uh, by uh, the uh, beginning of December. But on 13 November, the G20, as you probably have read, the um, Trump and she had an, a deal, and uh, 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 there is a three-month truce. But if there is no agreement and no significant move uh, from the Chinese side, uh, according to the U.S. Evaluation is not very clear what the U.S. is really asking. Then the risk is that uh, the the, uh, the tariff will be raised by from 10 to 25 percent. China is expected to retaliate, and therefore there is a risk of a major trade war uh, between China and the U.S. that could affect uh, uh, global economic growth. Um, the auto is the other th the other thing. I mean, it's difficult to see what. Uh, threat uh, can the uh, cars, Japanese and German cars, can represent uh, apart from uh, people walking on the street of the Fifth Avenue uh, that cross uh, when uh, the traffic light is red. But uh, uh, um, still, I mean, it's very important. I mean, 280 billion uh, um, of car imports uh, would be affected. You can expect retaliation. It's true that at the moment the EU, Japan and Korea are negotiating with uh, uh, the United States uh, uh, trade agreements uh, and therefore they would be temporarily accepted. But you can imagine that just the announcement uh, that uh, tariff could be introduced would have a major confidence impact uh, in a sector that already in the third quarter of this year has been particularly weak. Um, just to give you an idea on how the the negotiation seems to move uh, uh, and what seems to be the pattern of the United States. So the United States complain about uh, uh, unfair trade practices in the country X. The country X indicates that it's ready to negotiate. The US doesn't care much, launch an investigation under Section 232 or 301. The country X can or cannot uh, uh, um, uh, ret threaten retaliation. The important thing is it doesn't matter. Uh, the U.S. imposes tariffs uh, with exemption clauses so, and with timelines. So if in three months you don't do certain things, we will impose the tariffs. And that was what happened for steel and aluminum <coughs> and threaten new tariffs. So country X can retaliate or not retaliate. In any case, the U.S. is too important. You come to the negotiation table. The country X makes make concessions. <coughs> Making concession, there is the finalization of uh, uh, the uh, um, uh, on a draft between the U.S. and the country X, in a, on a deal in the, between the U.S. and the country X. So the U.S. administration can claim uh, that uh, a trade negotiation win, the best deal ever, is what happened with NAFTA. It's not revolutionary. There are not many changes, but. I mean, there is something more for the United States, uh, something less for uh, um, other, uh, uh, other countries, in particular for Canada. Um, in any case, the country X leaders fear that it would be much worse, the deal, so they are not too unhappy. I mean, Mexico was okay at the end with the, the, uh, with the new NAFTA. Uh, Canadians a little bit less, but still, I mean, the, the 
The fact is that creates a lot of political frustration for the country, in particular depending on the status of the country. I mean, Mexico, as I say, the, the was ready to go along. The, the, uh, the Canadians were much, much more uh, upset by the thing. You can imagine that the Chinese, uh, if something happens, would be upset even if they can, uh, can go through that. The effect on trade current account and trade deficit is insignificant. In reality, you continue to have a significant trade deficit and trade account because of the saving investment in balance. Uh, but I mean, the administration can say, you see, I mean, if I had not done this, we would be much worse. And, and therefore, you can move on and you go to countrywide. So this is a little bit how the thing functions. And therefore, it is a problem because in the end, the risk to uh, uh, undermining the multilateral trade system and uh, come back to a sort of, uh, um, I don't say, uh, relation, power relations where the strongest win the most and the, and the weakest have, uh, have to, give, uh, to give in. And, uh, and this is a risk, a structural risk uh, going forward. Um, let me say something on uh, uh, one thing that I've not touched so far, but is important when it comes to year two, because the Trump administration, as you might know, has criticized the monetary policy of the Fed, saying you are rising rates too fast and so on. Why they are saying so? I mean, the, uh, in reality, since the uh, Dodd-Frank Act and the reform, the, there is a, uh, the, there are some positive development, significant deleveraging of household. The subprime risk has, has almost vanished. The balance sheet of banks is sound, uh, and uh, there is high profitability of US companies. Um, however, there are risks emerging. A high valuation of equities is one. The other, that is, uh, uh, is how prices higher and rising in, in some areas. But the biggest risk is leverage loans that are. Um, this is a risk that uh, uh, has emerged. The, the, there are not many statistics, but the IMF is doing a good work to put in them together. Um, what are leverage loans? Loans that are given to highly leveraged companies that, that have a speculative grade with a very weak uh, uh, underwriting standard for credit quality. Um, this uh, uh, market is now bigger than the US Supreme Market, Supreme Market in 2006. And uh, this is partly due to the financial regulation that uh, uh, President Trump and the Trump administration have been able to introduce uh, in, uh, in some areas that is uh, <coughs> helping the expansion of this market. In fact, this market contracted in the two final years of the Obama administration. And uh, it can have important consequences for the economy. I mean, the, there is not the same risk as the subprime. The subprime is not in the balance sheet of the, the subprime was in the balance sheet of the banks. So when the, uh, it, it, it froze, it froze the entire system. Uh, the subprime is much more spread out and so on. It's in with uh, uh, pension funds, equity funds, uh, retailers, and so on. The risk is that if the market freezes, I mean, there will be important losses. And so what could could be a slowdown in the real economy, could rapidly become, because of the financial linkages, uh, a recession and a significant recession. Not a great recession or a big uh, or, 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 or a depression, but still, I mean, uh, uh, is procyclical and has uh, uh, a significant effect. So the, the Fed uh, has continues to normalize, but per historical standard, they, uh, uh, the interest rate in the United States uh, continue to be low and financial conditions con continue to be favorable for the president. So going to Tramponomics and the, uh, uh, the assessment. So what was the, is the model uh, of Tramponomics? Supply side economics, as I said, plus economic nationalist. So it's Laffer more than Keynes, but still there is a Keynesian component that uh, the um, former uh, 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 chief economist of uh, uh, Vice President Biden, Biden in, uh, in his blog has called uh, upside down Keynesianism. So you do, you stimulate the economy when the economy is uh, uh, um, at, 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 at close to full employment. Um, this, I say, is party and voluntary. I mean, the Republican in Congress, uh, uh, we uh, um, wanted to uh, um, have a, a tax neutral tax reform, but uh, 
fiscal neutral, fiscally neutral tax reform. They were not able, as explained, for political economy reasons to do that, and therefore they had to accept uh, a pro-cyclical fiscal stance, and therefore they consider it as a collateral damage. You have the opportunity, it comes once in a generation, let's take it uh, because it's too important for us. However, part is voluntary. Part is voluntary because it helps the political business cycle. As I said, it was the existential imperative for the administration to pass the tax cut, and uh, at that pass, uh, the, the, there was the risk of a collapse in the uh, midterm elections. And uh, um, the other thing is that moves the economy even stronger, so it gives uh, uh, the impression that the economy is really doing very well. And starve is the best because, as I say, at a certain moment you have to cut, and uh, uh, since it's difficult to uh, increase taxes, the hope is that uh, the, uh, uh, you will cut the, the federal government. Um, so in the short term, uh, while in the past this type of policies would have accelerated inflation and trigger a stronger response for the Federal Reserve, this time can be in the short term less damaging because uh, in the context of persistent low inflation in the United States, uh, as well as, <coughs> I don't know if you follow the, uh, the discussion on uh, uh, secular stagnation. So this is the model. So what is central in the Tramponomics is the investment-led growth, uh, driven by profits that are generated by tax reform, replacing and replace Obamacare, all the things that are pushing the uh, higher um, uh, uh, growth. Plus, there is some demand effect that comes from the tax reform and uh, uh, um, more aggressive tax trade policy and so on. But the issue is really the, the a sort of uh, uh, positive uh, uh, loop between uh, investment growth, productivity, and, uh, uh, and, and, and GDP growth. The, uh, um, so that, that is the way in which the, 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 the Trump administration the sort of core Trumponomics. Very rapidly because I have uh, almost no time left. So um, what has been the outcome? Stronger growth in the short term, unclear whether the potential growth of the economy is permanently lifted. Uh, stronger investment, but it's not clear whether it could be one off effect. This is the thing. I mean, the, if you look at investment, uh, the contribution, I think, that is the blue one. So you see, after the introduction of the tax cut, there is a big jump of investment, but in the third quarter, has stagnated. And fixed investment has been uh, uh, very weak. How do we explain that after such a powerful stimulus in the reduction of the corporate and so on? Is something that uh, uh, makes people wonder whether the uh, tax cut have only a temporary one-off effect rather than a, a permanent uh, jump in the investment ratio. Um, full employment, but still no wage overeating. Inequalities continue to rise. The inequalities. Um, the uh, sorry, it's no. well, it's somewhere uh, that we will find <laughs> that. Uh, um, the uh, now we, we saw that before. So the the, the inequalities are, are again after so decline are uh, are increasing, but the um, uh, um, the data are not the 2018 yet. So the the, the effect of the tax cut are not there. But they were still already increasing in 2017. Um, external imbalances are not on a declining path. High fiscal deficits despite strong growth. And limited buffer to counter the uh, next economic slowdown, plus a debt dynamics that is on an unsustainable path. So here may be only one thing. So what are the forecasts for next year? Um, for the, uh, this year, the US economy is, is expected to close to 3%. 2.9, um, and the number, as I say, is, is a decimal because uh, you you know you have almost all the data in. You will see already a slowdown in uh, uh, 2019 and uh, uh, growth going below uh, 2% in 2020, unless there is an agreement between Democrats and Republicans in Congress to introduce further fiscal stimulus. But I mean, this is an economy that. Uh, 
uh, in order to avoid uh, the, the, the slowdown has to continue to be fed by uh, um, finance weak, uh, sorry, favorable financial condition and fiscal stimulus and cannot continue forever because of, of the debt dynamic. Um, the, the, um, the interesting thing is that you can see, I mean, the <coughs> tax cut and the, the budget introduced a stimulus of 1.42 in 2018. Uh, the multiplier, therefore, is relatively small because uh, the economy was already trending to a growth of 2 point something percent. So the multiplier is probably 0.5, it's not lower. In 2019, you will have a slowdown in growth despite uh, a still positive uh, uh, um, stimulus, fiscal stimulus in the economy, which will decline in 2020, but in 2020 you will be already with a growth rate below 2%. And the deficit and the debt uh, are problematic because the, if you look only at the federal, it's already high. I mean, the, the you are in full employment and you're running a deficit of 4% uh, or 4.5% of GDP. Um, if you look at historical data, in general, um, in similar conditions or situations close to full employment and so on, the uh, federal deficit was in balance or slightly in surplus. So, I mean, this is an economy that is running strong, but uh, we are strong in balances. The, the federal deficit is not what we look in Europe. In Europe, we look at the government deficit. So Europe at the moment has 1.5 going below one uh, uh, soon. In the US, it's going above 5%. So it's very large federal, de uh, uh, federal and general government deficit. The federal debt is 80.9, 80, 81. The European one by 2020 will be around the same amount, slightly above. But if you look at the general government, the United States moved to 110. And if you project uh, uh, over uh, uh, 2030, as the Congressional Budget Office has done, the US will catch up with Italy in uh, the <coughs> last in the next decade so and i move to and well the the, the one thing just uh, to mention and so on there is no productivity revival so far despite the increased investment and the strong economic growth productivity is still stagnant we see an uptick uh, in the in the latest data but uh, it's difficult to say that there is a, a strong productivity growth trend Moving to the end, because I know that I passed the okay. thing. Um, so the challenge is ahead. So the, the Trumponomics uh, unfinished economic agenda has done quite a lot, nevertheless, despite the perception it has not done much, it's done quite a lot. Has not repealed and replaced Obamacare. Um, he has to try to make temporary tax cut permanent, otherwise the risk is that the economy will slow and uh, significantly. Um, investing infrastructure has gone nowhere um, and will continue to negotiate fair trade agreements. Um, will the democratic control in the House will not be easy, but uh, um, Nancy Pelosi, the House Speaker, is a very good negotiator, so compromises are possible although the political gridlock is the, probably the most likely outcome for most of the issue. And um, the trade issue will be one of the issues where the President Trump will spend most of his political capital. There is an important trade-off in 2020. Either you continue to support growth above 2%, three doesn't seem attainable, but then you widen further the, 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 the fiscal deficit um, or face a significant slowdown of the economy because the of, the <coughs> of the fading of the fiscal stimulus more and more unfavorable uh, uh, international economic conditions and uh, um, a significant slowdown in the US economy could translate, as I said, in a recession given the financial risk uh, which are pro-cyclical, and so once that you start to slow, the, uh, the financial risk increase uh, and uh, uh, create uh, a negative feedback loop. And I come to the conclusion. So the crucial question is, 
Trump, Trump economic continue to ensure that strong growth will continue until the presidential election or even longer. Uh, that is the issue. What are the strengths? The US companies have strong profitability still. The bank's balance sheet in much better condition in the past. US, holds, uh, US households uh, deleveraging uh, has gone uh, uh, quite far. And therefore, uh, the, the, uh, um, they are not in, uh, in a bad situation and that can support consumption. There are no significant inflationary pressures. The weaknesses? More unfavorable po uh, policy conditions, so normalization of monetary policy continues despite the pressure of the administration. The fiscal stimulus is fading. Uh, there is a more inf unfavorable uh, international environment. For 2017 and 2018, stars were aligned this time, so financial conditions were fine. Trump had the control of the Congress and the administration. The uh, uh, recovery was synchronized, sovereign debt crisis in Europe gone, China doing quite well, everything going quite well. So the, the, at the time the, 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 the stars were in line, now we start to see the synchronization of growth around the world and therefore a, a, a more unfavorable uh, international environment that is part due also to the trade tension generated by the policy of the administration. As I say, the maturity of the cycle in this cycle has been the one of the longest and is on track to become the longest in the US history, but for how long can continue. Growing financial risk and increase of social tensions because uh, an, uh, inequalities continue to go up. So is there a future for Tramponomics intended as a policy mix of supply side economics and upside down Keynesianism and economic nationalism? Can it work? We have seen that it has worked in the short term because of some special conditions, but it's far from clear that uh, it can uh, uh, run uh, for, for much longer. And finally, the question that uh, is still too early because we don't have sufficient information, but we can discuss uh, um, later in the question and answer session, is Tramponomics changing the structure of American capitalism and if so, in which direction? And I stop here. I went a little bit over, but I hope not too much. Thanks. Okay, so welcome back. Uh, I think we're going to just jump right into the presentation. We will, we will go over some of the things that we thought, uh, I mean, first of all, summarize uh, some of the things that, um, uh, that were highlighted both in the papers and in this uh, presentation today. Um, Again, we will, we will, uh, I will begin just by giving a little bit of a background behind, uh, you know, what Trump promises, promised. Um, Francesca will move on then with the, the domestic uh, effects of these uh, promises and policies, uh, while Ron then will explain more about the, the global effects, and we will then end with this discussion where you have uh, uh, the opportunity to ask some questions. Um, so. There was this call, of course, to make America great again, uh, where, where Trump he strongly advocated for, for the U.S. to be, to be back on track. Uh, but what does this really mean, uh, this great again? Well, uh, there were kind of three pillars of Trump's ideology. There's this isolationism, protectionism, and of course, this restriction immigration. Um, these topics, they were gaining this popularity even before Trump uh, became president, where the general public wanted the president to focus more on these um, domestic issues instead of being so involved in, in the global market. Um, and by doing so, Trump actually, I mean, it's kind of ignoring uh, the facts or uh, the bad consequences of the last uh, protectionism uh, uh, era or acts uh, in the 1930s. Um, and the critics are here saying that, I mean, this could happen again because with these, uh, with these policies, we're assuming that um, that the U.S. as a dominant player in the market, that they could uh, be immune to all these negative consequences from a potential trade wars. Um, but as we have seen, uh, or as the re readings at least suggest, that the U.S. could actually be the ones that are uh, the worst off from these. Um, so, what are the Trump actual pro uh, promises that Trump made? Well. 
Uh, these are mostly related to immigration, trade, uh, taxes and foreign policy. Uh, in terms of immigration, he wanted to fight terrorism and uh, limit this illegal immigration. immigration. Uh, for example, uh, build a wall or um, ban certain people from uh, entering the U.S. Uh, and of course, we can see that this is very, um, is very um, oriented to certain certain people, certain countries, certain religions, which is of course discriminatory. And we don't think that this either. Uh, I mean, helping uh, the trade relations. Um, in terms of uh, employment, uh, trade, and the kind of foreign policy. Um, Trump made it very clear that he wanted to bring back these manufacturing jobs to the U.S., um, including renegotiating this NAFTA agreement, uh, imposing these pro protectionist tariffs, um, as well as uh, ending several of these international agreements, as, for example, this Iran deal. Um, it didn't end there either, of course, because we've seen this, this uh, uh, few, uh, further um, exit from the, the global involvement here with the Paris uh, Agreement. Um, which, of course, was uh, in the interest of uh, America. Um, and um, even though he, he very proposes this uh, reduced uh, f I mean free trade, uh, he wants less global involvement, he's very much uh, involved in the global, you know, in the global in international relations. He's more than willing to trade uh, more... Uh, um, uh, trade other types of things like insults with uh, with North Korea, for here example, in a diplomatic summit. Uh, while we see also that he is international relations and his um, opinions or attitudes, uh, they they tend to fluctuate. Um, fi uh, finally, for for taxes um, and social welfare, I mean, he very much proposed to just get rid of this Obamacare. Um, he wanted to substitute this with this market-based alternative uh, with more competition. Uh, like he says here, it's more co comprehensive, affordable system. Uh, and as we know, you know, uh, there's co perfect competition markets. I mean, this, we feel like this kind of built on this idea because uh, we wouldn't need a, a system like this unless uh, there was a problem with the system already. So. Uh, he also wanted to b build the infrastructure, uh, as he has promised, uh, um, but more focused on this tax systems to bring the back these businesses to the U.S. Um, and to to uh, to bring these jobs back. But uh, as we'll see, this has not really uh, been the case. And and uh, as we're focusing more on this policy, I will let Francesca move on and explain more about exactly how it's affected the the do domestic markets. Um. Here you go. Thanks. <laughs> Sorry. So yeah, turning towards uh, looking at the kind of uh, key effects of the key economic policies, so the Tax Cuts Act and the um, tariffs from a perspective of the domestic effects to the US economy. So the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act was passed in December last year, and as was highlighted in the previous presentation, the kind of main takeaway points, the kind of key changes were the cut in the corporation tax, which was the mm. highest in US history, um, and also the lowering of the top rate of income tax for those earning over $600,000. Uh, and this, was going, this basically is going to leave a black hole in the government finances of 1.5 trillion over the next 10 years. Uh, Trump and his uh, supporters have argued that um, reducing the corporation tax. Uh, this is going to increase the cash flow to firms, and so they'll be better able to finance investment, and also it will increase the expectations um, of profits, and also encourage firms to hire more workers, thus boosting GDP, and uh, to quote Trump himself, this will be great for jobs, it will be fantastic for the middle income people, and for jobs, and most importantly, creating jobs. Yeah, he's kind of obsessed with making more jobs. Um, but in terms of what implications uh, these tax cuts have had on like key indicators, I mean, the from what they've said, from his rhetoric, it seems like it sounds good. But um, so far, it doesn't seem to have worked. Um, so there's a lack of response of um, firm fixed firms fixed investment. So if we're looking at 
uh, the capital spending index here. So most firms are responding that actually they're um, spending uh, below average still. Um, and actually, um, large corporations, they don't really, the increase in cash flow from the tax cuts doesn't incentivize them uh, to invest because they're not constrained um, by financing. Um, it basically depends uh, on financial markets. So where has actually this money gone? Oops. From the tax cuts, it's basically gone into uh, stock buybacks uh, from large companies. So the remunerations for uh, shareholders have like increased significantly. I think $700 billion in just the first two quarters of 2018 alone. Uh, and this has increased uh, equity values uh, for large corporations in the US. So basically, it's just propping up the stock market. Uh, in terms of, as we said before, um, employment was already increasing, so it's hard to say how much of an effect it's had, and also unemployment being at around 4%, like the natural rate, uh, perhaps on a more regional level, or maybe by sector analysis, we might be able to see some changes, but overall, not much. Uh, changes in real GDP, not much significant change. I mean, in the first quarter, there was, but then uh, the second quarter, there was uh, a lower percentage change in GDP. Uh, although, um, I think it's Nikki Forrest and Zeza, they're predicting that uh, over the next four years, um, there will be a cumulative increase in GDP of around 1%, but considering that the U US economy is already in a boom phase, this is quite a marginal um, impact, and it would have had a much greater impact if the US had been in recession um, or previously in the recovery, not during the boom phase as it is right now. Uh, and in terms of the impacts on households, uh, we can see here that the, the biggest winners of the tax changes are the ones uh, in the top income distribution and probably Trump himself. Uh, these are the households that also save more and so there'll be less of an impact on consumption, on GDP, and also indicates that probably uh, income inequality will um, increase, start increasing again. And if we look more specifically of the, the type of households that will benefit the most, uh, basically um, of the top 1% who are gonna benefit the most, 96% uh, of these in terms of ethnicity are white, and only 1% of these are African-American. So basically, ethnic minorities will least benefit from these tax changes. Um, and actually, overall, it will probably uh, increase uh, racial um, income inequality and sort of reverse the progress that was made uh, under the Obama administration. And then briefly, in terms of the domestic impact on tariffs, uh, the IMF and other global organizations have tried to kind of simulate the possible scenarios uh, from sort of uh, the trade tariffs and maybe perhaps a trade war. So in most of these, uh, the US would be the worst off. Um, I think in the worst case scenario, um, it would lose about 1% of GDP per year. Uh, one of the reasons for this is because uh, the tariffs are basically going to be paid by US companies, mainly retailers that are um, importing uh, goods from China, and then they'll be probably passing on uh, these higher costs to consumers. Uh, and consumer spending in the US makes up 70% of GDP, so this could be quite actually detrimental. And this negative effect will probably negate any positive effects that have come about from the tax cuts on GDP growth. And now to the global effects. Yeah, thank you. Uh, now to the global effects, mm, and we will cover the impact of taxes, tariffs, and other stuff on uh, the global uh, relationship of the, of the United States. Uh, now, one of the main uh, changes in the tax reform was the shift from territorial taxation, excuse me, from global taxation to territorial taxation. Namely, countries uh, are now will have to pay taxes only if they are operating inside the United States. So it basically gives an incentive to every multinational country to relocate to a tax haven or to any other place uh, in order to pay uh, less taxes. And um, 
it actually may accelerate a competition between countries, uh, some sort of race to the bottom in terms of uh, corporate taxation. And as far as I know, uh, in one of the articles, it was mentioned that uh, France has already cut uh, corporate taxes. So uh, it might be a first sign of this race to the bottom in which uh, the main, um, the biggest companies are actually, uh, can profit a lot because they're saving taxes. And uh, in terms of tariff, uh, tariffs, uh, imposition of tariffs may have a negative effect on the economy, both on the Chinese as well as on the US economy. And uh, actually countries that will substitute uh, Chinese exports to the United States, they may be better off, but of course uh, the American consumer will be those who will pay for this. And uh, the collateral damage is going to be not only on China, but actually on every country that is part of the supply chain. So the effect of those tariffs is actually a global one and not only on China. And uh, yeah, all of this is undermining the global uh, confidence in the United States. Some, uh, because of the import tariffs, some retali retaliationary measure, countermeasures were uh, imposed by the EU and by uh, Canada, which are uh, basically the closest allies of the United States, but also by uh, many other countries, including Mexico. And it actually um, raising concerns about the future of NAFTA and the cooperation with the United States. It causes disruptive uh, trade tensions between the United States and her allies. And uh, the hikes in interest rates in, in the United States that, may, that probably will, has happened as we saw and will happen because of the overheating of the United States economy may cause a capital flow, uh, flow reversals from the developing world back to the <coughs> United States. And all of that uh, may open a vicious cycle of confidence collapse when we have tariffs and barriers countermeasures uh, to address them, uh, confidence deterioration, uh, new risks uh, and higher costs, and more tariffs and more uh, countermeasures, which basically are undermining uh, the, rela the relationships and the confidence uh, between the United States and its allies. And uh, yeah, also climate change. Uh, as you probably know, neglecting the effects of climate change in the short run may create some profits in the short run, but it actually rises the costs of treating those effects in the long run. And as we know, Trump himself and many people from his own administration actually think that global warming is a hoax, so they not really believe in it. And he even uh, posted this tweet when he says that global warming is uh, as a conspiracy by the Chinese. Um, and yeah, it might also, neglecting the importance of global warming uh, may cause actually political stability because there were several uh, studies that explain the uh, war uh, in Syria, the civil war in Syria, uh, as a, a result of series of droughts. Uh, so the more global warming you have, the more droughts you have, and the more natural disasters uh, like that you may have in the future. And that's it, and now we are opening the floor for a discussions. Yeah, we, uh, we just wanted to uh, conclude with some final remarks, maybe start to some discussions uh, or some things that we w wanted to highlight and we would appreciate also if uh, Mr. Bertoldi would like to address these. Uh, the first one is in regards to the sustainability of these policies. Um, as there's not so much focus on the e equality, environmental issues, or even long-term effects, uh, perhaps due to this instability um, features. Um, so one of the propositions of this Levy Institute report was to focus more on this infrastructure. And of course, uh, this has been promised, and maybe not the specific one, but um, what, what uh, would you think that this uh, could have, what potential these type of projects could have in, in terms of sustainability and uh, redistributive effects? Um, the second remark is, is kind of um, concerning the consequences of these uh, protectionist policies. We have, of course, discussed um, potential trade wars, but, but is there an end to this, and what would that be in that case? Um, uh, since we have these uh, spillovers, would it be a case where uh, other countries could actually try to uh, exclude the US from the market? Or would that even be uh, an option? Um, and in addition to this globalization, we have highlighted that liberalization and, and financialization specifically, has, they've been very much contributing to these, this inequality and underinvestments, in specifically in innovation that could have produced more uh, 
productivity. So in addition to these fiscal support or fiscal changes, uh, what would these innovation policies, what kind of role could they play? And not only in the supply side, but also having a, uh, considering the more demand side of it. Um, and that is all for us. I mean, there was a question here in yeah, regards so to... Yeah, so <laughs> okay, so that's all for us. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> so I come back to <laughs> the starting the question. Maybe it's better that I put again the um, my slides um, and after this time. But let's leave <coughs> start with this. Um, So the, the, as I say, there was in the um, Trump administration also the idea of having uh, um, big infrastructure uh, projects, um, mostly uh, not financed by government, but the so-called public-private partnership. So to mobilize through uh, federal guarantees, private capital to make investment uh, that could be that can go from motorway airports uh, pipelines uh, and so on it has never uh, um, taken off despite there has been one or two investment uh, infrastructure weeks uh, where the president and uh, a member of the administration are going around there are various reasons one i mean have not been uh, uh, political priority. Second is that the Republican in Congress uh, were afraid that uh, this would further uh, uh, increase the deficit and the debt of, of the United States. But there are also technical reasons. I mean, the, um, the legislative and financial infrastructure to this uh, public private partnership, uh, if you want to avoid that, is simply a transfer of money. Uh, sort of uh, uh, um, uh, privatization of benefits and profit and uh, uh, um, while making the losses public needs uh, uh, rather a, a complex system and, uh, uh, um, and, and legislation uh, in place. So in Europe, in that respect, we are much more advanced. We have the European Investment Bank. Uh, uh, we have uh, uh, a project, for instance, the Juncker Plan and so on, that are created uh, with uh, um, uh, a system that ensures that there is uh, a right or quasi right balance between what the private can contribute and how you mobilize the private capital to make uh, uh, um, public investment. But we have more than 30 years experience. I mean, the um, that is not the case of the United States, where this infrastructure doesn't exist. And so if you want to do public-private uh, partnership, you immediately uh, have a number of obstacles uh, uh, in terms of uh, lack of legislation, uh, uh, lack of clarity on what to do, where, and therefore you, they have not gone, not surprising, not, not very, very much fast enough. What the, uh, um, what will happen the, uh, um, uh, in, in a couple of years in promoting sustainability uh, and redistributive effect depends on what happens in the elections of 2020. So whether President Trump is re-elected or whether the Democrats uh, will come up with, uh, 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 with a candidate that will be able to, uh, um, to be the incum incumbent, uh, the competition has only started, and I spoke to a number of uh, um, uh, um, Democrat-leaning economists. There are a number of ideas, but there is no coherence yet. So we will have to see who is the candidate that will win the primaries and on which electoral platform uh, it will, uh, he or she will win. Most likely, uh, uh, some of the elements are uh, increase of the minimum wage, uh, make uh, introduce legislation to fix uh, um, the problem of Obamacare, which has been in any case badly damaged by the attempt to repeal it by, uh, uh, by President Trump. Uh, the infrastructure is running high, but they will have to see how it can be made compatible with uh, 
uh, the fiscal constraint that uh, uh, a new administration would have to face. Uh, and uh, on trade, it's very unclear. I mean, the Democratic Party is quite divided. Some are quite sympathetic to uh, the trade policy approach taken by uh, um, President Trump. Some are more critical. It will be interesting to see what happens when they will have to vote uh, uh, to ratify the new deal between the uh, US, uh, Canada, and Mexico, um, where some of the concerns that some Democrats had have been taken into account. On the other hand, if they vote for it, uh, it will be a major political victory for, for, for the president. So we will have to see. Um, consequence of protectionist policy uh, how could the trade war escalate? We'll see. I mean, the China is the big elephant in the room. Uh, uh, we will have to see whether in these three months they are able, the negotiations are ongoing, whether they are able to find uh, an agreement that avoids the escalation of, uh, of trade wars. Uh, we are making pressure. I mean, the, the one of the things where the European Union, together with Canada and Japan, uh, has been able to make a slight difference, maybe a major difference if it goes uh, uh, in, the, uh, in the right direction, is to convince uh, uh, the United States uh, and China and therefore the G20 in general to uh, work to modernize the WTO and in the WTO to uh, uh, address also issues that for the time being uh, are not addressed and that have allowed countries uh, 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 like China, but not only China, to game the system. One is the issue of intellectual property rights, the other is how state-owned enterprises uh, and subsidies they receive from the state uh, distort uh, uh, global competition, creating situation of uh, unfair trade practices. All this was not Consider when the WTO was created uh, and, uh, and therefore there is a need of an update. Um, the important thing would be to bring, again, the, the, uh, to move from a situation that, that you have now of bilateral managed trade, uh, that is what the, uh, uh, the Trump administration is privileging, while keeping still, however, a, a multilateral dimension, to a situation where the multilateral dimension takes over compared to the uh, uh, um, bilateral managed trade. Um, Role of innovation and growth uh, uh, for growth and, and development uh, um, is uh, uh, um, clearly important. I mean, one of the things, if you read the, the article by uh, um, Barrow uh, and Furman, uh, you find that uh, the tax, uh, the corporate side of the tax cuts that have been introduced uh, and the tax reform uh, uh, provides an incentive to development. Uh, but taking away a number of uh, uh, um, uh, um, uh, incentives to research and development, research and development will in fact decrease. Um, and therefore, there is a discussion on how to avoid that. And I mean, the, 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 the number of proposals, uh, um, as the US will naturally try to, to, to keep the lead uh, in, uh, uh, in terms of innovation and growth. Um, are the policy orthodox uh, and the heterodox? I realized that when I was uh, um, uh, uh, mentioning the uh, Reagan supply side, I they said incorrectly they are not economists. I mean, I wanted to say they are not mainstream economists. So there is an heterodoxy also on the conservative side. I mean, and, they, and, and these people represent it. They, they see everything in terms of. Uh, 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 incentives uh, uh, that you provide through uh, taxation policies and they estimate uh, or they are strongly believe that uh, this is the, uh, uh, the strongest way to, uh, uh, to, to, to stimulate the economy and in fact I mean one of these uh, uh, um, economists wrote a couple of uh, uh, um, years ago a book called Iconoclast um, the iconoclast that they were referring to this uh, 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 Reagan supply siders uh, and, and so on. So in a way, it's interesting. Peter Navarro is not part of them because I mean they are free traders, but they are for Peter Navarro has interesting uh, uh, developments. I mean the, 
he wrote once a book with uh, uh, Glenn Hubbard, who was the uh, chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors of President Bush on trade policy in general. Where the book was supposed to be bipartisan, and Navarro was considered to be the presenting the, 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 the position of the Democrats. Um, and since then, he has uh, uh, evolved and has moved to the uh, um, uh, populist side. If you can put back the, um, the slides that we had before, the. Yeah, so. If we go back to, uh, it black. Sorry, the, um, I have to go back there. Um, so the, the, uh, you remember probably the, the two axes, nationalism and the liberal conservative, uh, the So on trade, I mean, the, the, this position in the past were rather the position of the, uh, um, uh, of the uh, um, left uh, in the Democratic Party. Can you just have a quick yes. clarification? Regulation versus financial regulation? Um, well, the re uh, uh, regulation, uh, no, not only financial regulation. You have the regulation in general, so okay. that should be rather deregulation, yeah. Um, and so Trade was where the uh, 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 liberal left it was uh, quite uh, 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 opposed to uh, uh, the uh, uh, um, let's say mainstream trade policies of the previous administration. One thing not to forget, for instance, the TPP, the Trans-Pacific uh, uh, Partnership. Uh, if uh, President Obama had put it uh, uh, for approval in Congress and he decided instead to postpone it to the new president, uh, he would have had to rely massively on the Republican Party because uh, he had less than half of uh, the Democratic member of Congress who supported it. But the, Democrat the Republican Party, on the contrary, until Trump arrived, uh, was the party of free trade and, uh, that, and would have voted massively in favor of the Trans-Pacific Partnership. So, I mean, there's been really a change in the nature also of, of the Republican Party and the coalition that uh, uh, was uh, uh, behind the, the Republican Party because the, the Republican Party in the past was considered the party of the evangelicals, so, I mean, religious group that are quite conservative and so on, plus the Chamber of Commerce. And the Chamber of Commerce are very free trade and so on. The thing has changed, so it has much more base of uh, uh, um, uh, white, blue colors, uh, 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 lower uh, uh, middle classes, and the clearly the, the part of Chamber of Commerce has, has weakened significantly. So uh, we will open the floor for any questions. So I would just like to remind you uh, to state your name and what option you're in when you're. Uh, when you start your question, and also just to try to keep it uh, for one question, uh, so we can allow more people to ask. So we will start with the. Uh, Should we take two yeah. questions at a time? Yeah. Okay. Hi, my name is Sophie. I'm from Option B, Macroeconomics and Financial Regulation, and um, I have a pick. I have a question that would concern actually this picture, which is just concerning the monetary policy of the United States. You know, President Trump has hardly, like, harshly criticized Janet Yellen when she was still in power, and he has put in place Jeremy Powell, I think that's his first name. Powell, yeah. um, and he was now also hardly criticized, and the markets took it when he made a speech one day after the president criticized him that he's not going to raise further the interest rates. Um, I wonder, um, because Trump has been before the um, election often said, oh, if he's elected, he might open up the box of Pandora, trying to evoke the independence of the Fed. Where would you put his monetary policy in there? Um, and what is really his stance on monetary policy? What does he hope to gain from the criticism with Paul? I don't quite can make a sense of what he's doing. Yeah. Well, on monetary policy, I mean, the, I would really don't know where to put uh, in the uh, in the thing because really in general there is a consensus uh, um, within Democrats and Republicans has been uh, uh, there for uh, um, 
many, many years that the Fed uh, is uh, independent and therefore the, uh, the administration doesn't comment uh, on the uh, policy, on the monetary policy. Even when, I mean, the, the sometimes the, 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 uh, it is difficult to swallow. And one of the reasons for which uh, President Bush Sr., who passed away recently, lost the elections was that uh, the, uh, 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 the Federal Reserve tightened monetary policy after uh, the uh, 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 first Iraq war uh, because the economy was uh, uh, overeating and therefore that caused a slowdown and, uh, um, and was the, its economy stupid by uh, Bill Clinton that led to the victory uh, of the president. In the president Trump, for his experience uh, as a real estate uh, uh, CEO, inevitably likes low interest rates. Uh, because that means more mortgages, uh, household by house, and so on. The, the, um, I would say, however, that the, the, the his declaration and tweets about monetary policies of Chairman Powell was mostly polit tact political tactic motivated. I mean, the President Trump took uh, the, uh, how can I say, um, uh, the, the, the uh, uh, responsibility of the benefit of a rapidly raising stock market, as we have seen that uh, that was uh, uh, raising pretty rapidly. I mean, the, 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 this graph uh, flattens a little bit, but then you can see that I mean that there has been a very rapid increase in the, in the stock market. They say is because my policy and so on. Now you go to the last period and things become much more, um, how can I say, uh, volatile uh, with uh, uh, a significant, uh, oh yeah. with much more fluctuation. So I mean, the, the, uh, uh, this is the index of volatility. And if you look at the stock market after having gone above 26,000, it's now hovering around 24,000. So there must be some reason for which uh, the, the thing, I mean, the, and one way is to shift the blame uh, to others. And I mean, monetary policy, you know, if you tighten uh, uh, in general as uh, a dumping effect uh, on the stock market. But apart from that, you have not seen a sort of uh, coordinated move by the various members of the administration, Treasury Secretary, the Director of the National Economic Council to attack the Fed. I mean, the, the, I don't think that that is, uh, they are not putting into question the, uh, uh, the independence uh, of the Federal Reserve. As I say, it looks to me a more tactical move to, um, let's say, shift the blame on the, on the current volatility. So, uh, Louisa, okay, I'll r start writing down names. Yes. I'll pass over to Louisa. Yeah. Sorry, I forgot that I had to take three. So, yeah, we'll take yeah. Louisa, Laura, and then Chris. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm Louisa, I'm also from option B, but from another track. Um, and, oh yeah, my question was, uh, if you can enlighten me a bit about the NAFTA, because I was reading recently something um, in regards to the, the recent changes they made. And as far as I understood, they actually cut the power of these um, investor states dispute settlement courts, which is a rather progressive step, yeah. I would say. So I was wondering wh whose influence achieved that and, and if you know something about that. All right, uh, I'm Tore, I'm from Option C, that's development policies. Uh, I would like to look like two years ahead, and uh, you already mentioned the kind of divided Democratic Party, and I think like Nancy Fraser coined this term of progressive neoliberalism, which we have, like with the maybe the Clinton era uh, in, uh, in the Democratic Party, but now we have like the progressive socialists around Bernie Sanders, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, Ilan Omar, uh, and they proposed uh, like models for a living wage program and the Green New Deal. And I would like to ask you if you could uh, give us some insight. What do you think? Like uh, who is prevailing, maybe in 2021, out of this uh, Democratic Party, and who could be candidates, maybe? Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Uh, unfortunately, I have two questions. Uh, um, um, Chris from Development Policies, but I can maybe just start with one and then see if I have time. Um, you were talking about the leveraged uh, assets, and I was really wondering about, about those because I was recently also reading about them. And um, I mean, like, you also com uh, compared them to the subprime uh, asset bubble, and I would really wonder, as I think Bern Bernanke in the times of the um, subprime mortgage uh, crisis, he said before, I think in 2007, uh, yeah, we do not think it's going to take over to the real economy, and there's, w there's not going to be like a, a big crisis. So, in how far could you really say that there's not going to be those linkage factors to the real economy? And could it be really, really be said that the, this is like a, not a, a new asset bubble, or like, what does it make not a, well, why is it not an asset bubble in your, in your consideration then? So I start in reverse. So on the uh, leverage loans, of course, after the, the subprime crisis, I mean, the, the, uh, the international financial institutions uh, and the uh, domestic uh, uh, supervisor regulators have become uh, uh, much more attentive uh, on possible imbalances that develop uh, and that uh, they have systemic uh, uh, implications. The, um, and therefore, I mean, the, um, you are looking really at the uh, uh, gray areas where the uh, supervisors, uh, uh, because of various reasons, the uh, not uh, uh, strong supervision uh, regulation might be uh, more lax uh, and so on. But you look, you have to look also, I mean, the, the, the subprime was both uh, uh, a, a domestic, uh, uh, sorry, a, a demand a supply uh, uh, um, uh, problem in the sense that, I mean, the, 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 uh, uh, the supply were a package uh, in, uh, uh, in a number of financial products that uh, were highly toxic, but not perceived as highly toxic, but also the fact that they remained in the balance sheet of the banks, uh, and therefore that created a short circuit that uh, 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 made the, the crisis systemic. I mean, the, uh, what we have is that, I mean, these leverage loans, uh, uh, um, at the moment, I mean, the, they're still quite profitable. I mean, you know, they have very good performance. I mean, also because they are indexed uh, to LIBOR, so the, the, they are quite interesting for uh, uh, investors. Maybe too interesting because, I mean, the, the uh, uh, investors are aware that uh, some of these loans will not be recovered, but they still expect that the re recovery rate will be between 70 and 80. But if you have a downturn, it could go, usually go to 50, 60, and therefore uh, you incur in large uh, uh, um, uh, portfolio losses. The thing is that according to the, 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 the numbers that you have, the, uh, um, as I say, the, only a small part are in the balance sheet of banks. Um, there, um, there is a growing part that it goes to uh, um, retail investors because they offer high interest rates. Um, and there is another part that are in mutual funds and so on because the, the, the they need to have, uh, there is a, a search for yields uh, uh, in order to be able to pay, uh, I mean, the pension funds, the pension and so on. But they are quite, they are more spread. So, I mean, the the analysis that the, uh, so far that the IMF has done doesn't seem to indicate that if there is a freeze of the market, uh, the, the, uh, you will have a systemic crisis. What you will have is rather a sort of procyclical effect. So the, the, there will be investors that take large losses. Some uh, pension funds and mutual funds uh, uh, might uh, lose quite a lot of money. The financial condition will become significantly tighter and uh, the central banks have less margin for maneuver. So what happens is that uh, <coughs> doesn't seem at the moment that this will create, as I say, the, the also because there are senior uh, um, uh, 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 the, uh, uh, products uh, and therefore they are covered by some collateral uh, uh, that should be a little bit more uh, uh, um, should be better than the one that you had in the, in the case of, of the subprime. 
Having said that, I mean, the, 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 the risk is there. The analysis, however, I say, that because of, there is much more attention on the, on, on the systemic risk that existed before the, uh, um, uh, the great financial crisis. Uh, my impression is that, I mean, the, the leverage loans can be a factor that uh, make a slowdown or a recession deeper and possibly longer but they will not repeat the, uh, 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 the doom loop uh, financial real economy that we have seen in 2008-2009. With regard to the, uh, what will happen to the Democratic Party, I mean, the, the it's true there is a progressive part that has uh, uh, a number of, go uh, uh, of uh, bold proposals. I think that the uh, um, the Democratic Party will move in any case away, and that will be a sort of permanent legacy of uh, what uh, uh, um, of what happened in 2016 with uh, uh, President Trump. So they will move away from the uh, completely fiscally responsible uh, budget neutral, sorry, proposals that uh, uh, um, Hillary Clinton had. So the um, uh, I still think that, I mean, the, so here you see, I mean, the, the, um, everything was really very well calibrated in the uh, um, uh, program of Hillary Clinton, was fully consistent. Uh, um, rather surprising, people didn't notice that it had a huge redistribution program inside. Over four years, it should have redistributed one trillion dollars uh, from the richest to the lower classes. Having said that, there is a caveat. I mean, it should have been approved by Congress, and Congress was, uh, was controlled by Republicans, so it was not considered uh, uh, really realistic. Um, so the, the I think that uh, in the program, as I say, there will be infrastructure, there will be increase of the minimum wage. It will be interesting to see uh, how much uh, of the green economy there will be. I mean, as I say, President Obama, if you look at his achievement in terms of fight to climate change, well, relevant, I mean, very significant. I mean, the, the solar power multiplied by 10 during these eight years and uh, other alternative energy and so on. But uh, because of that, he lost uh, a number of key states that are still clearly old economy and uh, very high energy uh, intensive. So, I mean, the battle will be fought, we know, in four or five states. And the four or five states are Michigan, Ohio, Indiana, Pennsylvania, West Virginia, and so on. And therefore, I mean, the inevitably, there will be have to be uh, some compro compromise on that if the Democrats want to, uh, um, to win the election. So it's very difficult to see at this moment, uh, I mean, whether the, uh, um, the, 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 the candidate will prevail will be in the sort of Hillary Clinton mold where the, uh, um, uh, let's say, the, the, there will be a sort of uh, fiscal conservatism that in a way could be considered inevitable because of the imbalances of the fiscal that I was mentioning or whether you will have uh, a sort of uh, candidate with uh, bolder but also more expensive uh, uh, proposals and uh, in such a case, how, in case he wins or she wins, uh, uh, that will be reconciled once uh, 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 you go to government. In that respect, the experience of Obama is not very useful because it started in the deep of the deepest uh, recession since the Great Depression, and therefore I had to, uh, uh, to face a completely different script. Uh, with regard to the question of uh, the uh, dispute settlement mechanism, I mean, yeah, there, there, there's been uh, changes, I mean, rather in, uh, in the direction that uh, uh, the Canadians in, in premise didn't like. Um, it's something that also raises some concern in our negotiations with, uh, with the United States. Uh, this is one of the side effects uh, on which the, the United States consider that the, this type of dispute settlement mechanism uh, were not favorable to uh, 
uh, the US companies and they wanted uh, something where they uh, 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 would, uh, let's say, that there would be <coughs> uh, a different way of deciding things that would be more favorable to, to companies and in general to, to US companies. Uh, and this is one of the concessions that they get, as I say, the, the most of the thing uh, uh, were not excessive in, the, in what the United States asked in the, in the final uh, settlement, but there are a number of things uh, on which uh, they create problems creating a precedent uh, or uh, introducing, uh, for instance, certain rules uh, um, in the case of uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, the uh, US MCA agreement uh, on possible quotas and so on that are incompatible with the rules of the WTO and on which I mean it's important to be uh, uh, concerned because I mean little by little they undermine the multilateral trade system. Thank you. Um, I'm Niels and I come from option C, which is development and macroeconomics. And my question is kind of linked with that of Chris, but instead of talking of that leverage loans, um, like I would rather think about the, um, the student debt problem and the, the financialization of the student debt, because like the criteria that you give for saying that the, the leverage loans are more healthy in a way on the bank accounts, uh, on the bank's um, balance sheets, and because of the structure of the loans, I do understand them, but like, is that doesn't seem for me to be so true for the student loans. And for the student loans, they kind of seem to have that um, dynamic, which is very, very similar to that of the subprimes, especially with the defect loans and the non-repaying rates that are o far over 10% for already four or five years now. Yeah. And isn't that like kind of a far bigger threat and could that not work with the like precarization of a lot of workers, exactly like the subprime four years ago. Yeah, I mean the the. Um, oh, sorry. See, I think yes. Uh, hello, my name is Isabel. I'm, I come from uh, knowledge and innovation policies, and I wanted to raise the question on uh, the media and the role of the media in Trump's administration. And and uh, to what extent do you, in your opinion, uh, the Trump's economic policies uh, can be um, influenced by the hot topics in 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 the media and trend? There was a second question, no? <laughs> yes. Actually, I was just wondering about, um, it's something I, I heard some time ago, but it, I'm not sure how it is, and this was just was like in single newspaper articles. There is apparently a um, kind of big opposition within USA against like some policies of Trump, so regarding climate, regarding, I guess, also fiscal and, and taxation. Like that, some states, some governors, some cities, and also some um, like govern uh, like agencies. I think opposed um, some of the. I think especially ecological um, issues Trump is or like policies Trump is raising. And would really like to know how strong or like um, can we consider this uh, this anti-Trump movement, which is like within the agencies sometimes. So like within the body of the United States. Is it considerable? Is it like is it like a serious um, maybe also threat to to Trump or to Trump's aims? And can we take this as a sign of hope maybe for for the U.S. and uh, its climate uh, engagement? So this time I will go in order. Uh, uh, so the um, student loans are indeed a problem, um, but their size compared to leverage loans uh, it is uh, uh, is much smaller. So the the um, here is a problem for uh, various reasons, uh, including the financial part, but I mean, the, the, there are other reasons. I mean, the, uh, one of the reasons for which you have in the United States so very high healthcare costs and so on is because, I mean, the, if you want to become a doctor, uh, in particular specialized surgeon and so on, and you have to take loans uh, that uh, you will repay when, I mean, uh, you finish the repayment when they're 50 or 60, and uh, you need uh, really to charge uh, very high fees. I mean, that, that, that is, uh, and I mean, this 
student loans, I mean, they, they, they uh, have uh, uh, increased significantly. President Obama uh, introduced uh, some uh, uh, measures to uh, keep them under control and to keep uh, uh, interest rates uh, uh, low. Uh, part of the deregulation that I was mentioning has also removed some of these things and the, and the problem is com is, uh, has come back. As I say, the, the size doesn't seem such to create a major problem in terms of the balance sheet of the banks, but still, I mean, it's a big social pro uh, uh, problem and this is, will be one of the top priorities of the uh, uh, House of Representatives the, uh, uh, controlled by Democrats uh, uh, priorities. The, uh, um, this is where in the, the uh, um, uh, people like uh, uh, Nancy Pelosi will try to establish a, a discussion and a sort of transaction uh, deal with the uh, uh, with the administration. And I mean, the, the, that happened already during the Bush administration uh, um, in, uh, um, in 2000, uh, when the Democrats uh, took, uh, uh, took back the House and the Senate in, in 2006. I mean, the Nancy Pelosi said, OK, I will finance, uh, despite I dislike it completely, your, uh, the, 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 the effort uh, in, uh, in Iraq. but." Uh, um, I want a deal on a minimum wage uh, uh, and uh, a couple of other things. Probably there was also at the time uh, uh, the issue of, uh, of student loans. And I think that this will be on the table in the negotiation that uh, 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 the House controlled by the Democrats and the administration will have uh, in the coming months. So <coughs> and if there is a deal, there will be clearly a, a, a reduction of, of, of the problem uh, uh, in uh, uh, um, before the, the presidential election and would be probably one of the um, deliverables that the Democratic Congress will use uh, uh, when the, there will be the elections in, uh, uh, in 2020. Um, your question was on uh, the media. Yeah. So the... Uh, how much the decisions are driven by distracting factors that can be the Russia investigation and how goes to the media and uh, 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 various other things. I mean, the, in a way, not much. I mean, the, the Trump has clearly a uh, conflictual relations with uh, the enemies of the people, to quote him. Uh, but, I mean, the, the, you have to not forget that most of the things have been done in, in the first year. So tax cut uh, or not done, like uh, the repeal and replace, uh, the regulation and so on. So I the, the I think that the is more rather on foreign policy, domestic issues uh, uh, that are not on the economy that uh, the media part plays uh, or can play a role in the way in which uh, uh, um, there can be, a, 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 a say, um, to open new fronts to change the narrative. So if the focus is uh, 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 on Russia, you could have, uh, let's say, some declaration on North Korea or Iran that uh, um, change the narrative and the, and the focus of the media. But not, uh, I would say, that the, the economic policy doesn't seem to be, uh, to have been particularly affected by the conflictual relations with, 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 with the media. Um, and the, uh, um, your question, sorry. About um, different bodies and agencies. Ah, yeah, for the thing. I mean, the, it's true. I mean, the, the, um, it's important to know that the states have uh, uh, very strong regulatory powers. And in some issues, I mean, they are uh, uh, determinant even more than the federal government. So carbon emissions by car, if uh, California set a standards, uh, the standards become almost uh, immediately, if not universal, but uh, all the west side of the United States uh, will, will do the same. And therefore, they, they, and also the car producer, they have to adapt because I mean they cannot produce a car that cannot sell in California, right? 
So that is very important because they set uh, a sort of uh, new standards that uh, in a way uh, uh, limit uh, the negative impact uh, of the withdrawal of the United States from, from the Paris Agreement. Um, however, that works for uh, a number of, uh, uh, um, of products, but not on, uh, uh, on other issues, for instance, like uh, the, clear, the Clean Air Act, where the regulations are rather, so I mean, you can produce, I don't know, the, the uh, electric power station, you can have limits in California, but uh, this doesn't necessarily affect uh, the way you produce energy in Tennessee. So, uh, on certain areas, however, it's true. I mean, the, the carbon emissions by car, I mean, California set the standards, uh, and the other states, also because they have not the legislative know how and the resources that California has, simply they say we copy the law that comes from the. Uh, uh, um, uh, from California, therefore California is at the standard, and we know that California in that respect is ahead uh, uh, in terms of uh, the thing. And so the, the, there is, uh, um, so the withdrawal from Paris uh, is a very bad news in terms of fighting the climate change, but uh, there are mitigating factors that depend on the uh, 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 state and, uh, and also cities, and in fact, I mean, the, as the European Union, we have a constant dialogue with them on these issues. Maybe just one last quick question. Yeah. Yeah. Um, hello, my name is Yannick. I'm also from Option C, Development Economics. And I uh, just would um, like to ask you to give a guess on uh, a guess on your own question. So, uh, will the current uh, short-term growth, um, um, yeah, be as long as to the next uh, election? Sorry, the, the current, <coughs> the, the current uh, growth that yeah. we uh, see in the U.S., which you elaborated on in the presentation, will it long uh, until the next election? The Democrats would be ready to make a grand bargain with President Trump, uh, where they would, uh, um, let's say, put in place uh, a big infrastructure uh, 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 investment program, mostly financed with public money, uh, um, and in exchange, to, uh, they accept to build some. Uh, vertical infrastructure of the border between Mexico and, uh, and the United States. Um, so the, uh, um, this, however, doesn't seem to be in the cards. I mean, the, the, you could have rather smaller deals that will allow the Democrats to go back to the constituency to say, you see, I mean, we, we were open for business and so on, but not to provide a large stimulus that, of course, would uh, give to President Trump the uh, um, possibility of, uh, um, uh, uh, of claiming that uh, his tramponomics is working and uh, it will last. So the, the uh, um, and the Democrats seems to be aware of that. So the, it looks unlikely that there will be this grand bargain. But I mean, the, in the grass king, that would be the, the way it would work. Also because I mean the and that is. Uh, where, in a way, uh, President Trump has changed the narrative uh, in the United States. Um, as you probably know, in Europe we look a lot to uh, um, public deficit and public debt. And that was also the case until uh, uh, during the Obama administration. Part because the Republicans, in a way, had very different policies, and so they were playing all the time in this. Uh, administration as uh, creating a huge hole in the uh, in public finances. Uh, the uh, deficit has been over one trillion dollars. Uh, of course, that was due to the crisis and so on. But when you do politics, you don't go too much in the nuances, right? And so, and the Democrats, I mean, the, in a way, they have built uh, since Clinton the reputation of being the part of fiscal responsibility. That is shown also by the program of Hillary Clinton. 
So the, the uh, <coughs> with Trump arriving uh, uh, in power and having the Republican completely moving in the idea that uh, if we create the next and that with uh, the tax cuts uh, is all fine, and with the Democrats saying, well, when we follow this policy, we lose the elections, uh, the, uh, uh, the focus on the fiscal has gone away um, quite significantly, despite the fact that, as I saw, the, the uh, debt dynamics uh, and the deficit dynamics are not very uh, uh, encouraging. I mean, the, if you have uh, a recession in the United States, in the current conditions, uh, the deficit in the United States will go rapidly to 7 8% of GDP. Um, so the, the, um, because of that, I mean, the, uh, um, it's not impossible, and the financial markets put, I think, a quarter or even more chances that in 2020 you could have a recession year, uh, if they are not uh, uh, stimulative policies. Most of all, what I say, I mean, the, as the demand is evolving, you will have a uh, soft landing, uh, with growth going below potential, but not much. But if you add the, the negative impact to come from the financial side, I mean, it would easily make a case for, 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 for a recession. Um, but, I mean, and the foreign policies will have uh, a fundamental role in determining what will be uh, 2020. But even if you go beyond 2020, a certain moment, I mean, the, I don't think that uh, there is a case yet uh, that indicates that Tramponomics uh, has lifted permanently growth uh, from uh, uh, its 2% uh, pattern to, uh, uh, to a higher level. And therefore, because of that, in the business cycle, I mean, the, the, uh, you could easily uh, go below whether it will be and going to recession and, and uh, having uh, in future much lower growth rate. Um, but the weather that will be 2020, 2021, I would say very much policy dependent. And uh, that allows me to conclude with, because I forgot to show you the last slide. So it takes a little bit of the beginning. And the last slide, this one. Yeah. Oh, so far so good, but uh, you don't know where you land. <laughs> this is written in the market. Okay, so thank you again for joining us today.